Hello, welcome to a video on Layer 2 NAT or Layer 2 Network Address Translation or how to handle duplicate IP addresses in an industrial network. So before we jump into Layer 2 NAT and how it works, I want to level set on an example and I'm going to use this example of this machine. Now this is not a real machine, I made this machine up but what's important about this is in sophisticated machines are made up of multiple components that are IP addressable. And so individual components have their own IP addresses, which is what you see in 192.168.1.3, 192.168.1.4, those individual components. And oftentimes there is a controller or this main controller and it's got dual NICs. It's got an outside interface and an inside interface. Inside interface for communicating with the components of the machine and an outside interface for communicating with the rest of the world. And if the only communication you need to have with the machine is through that outside interface, you, you do not have a problem. You do not need layer two NAT. But I'm not trying to talk you out of it. Um, but that's just saying. So this is where we start to see duplicate IP addresses when we have multiple machines. Every machine is essentially the same. They all have the same components. They're all running the same software. And the software is used the hard-coded IP addresses to identify the components. So therefore, in every machine, the HMI is going to have the same IP addresses. So this is where the duplicate IP addresses start to show up in these industrialized networks. Okay. Now, this is where you start to see and you need layer two NAT. I need to communicate with every HMI. Right? There's multiple HMIs. They all have the same IP address. And we're not going to change the software to stop using hard-coded IP addresses. So we have to adjust. And layer two NAT on the IE switches comes into play in these scenarios. When we're talking about layer two NAT, the IE switch is doing this translation from private or duplicate IP addresses to public or unique. So just we're going to use the term private and public a lot. For layer 2 NAT, it's a one-for-one -one translation. So for every HMI in machine one, there is a unique public IP address. And the HMI in machine two has a different unique public IP address. So it is a one-for-one -one translation. It's not one for N like you have in your home network. Right? The does it at line rate, it does it bidirectionally, right? and again there's the public and private terms. And of course it works with ICMP and ARP, it has to work within a real network. And I'm going to use the IP addresses 192.168 as, as, as examples, but the translation can be on any layer 4 IP address. So here we're going to have a quick example of, and we're going to set this up before we get into how layer 2 NAT works. We have a data collection application sitting somewhere in the local network. It's not in the same subnet as 10.0.0x, so we're going to have to have our layer 3 device route to it, but it needs to communicate with the HMI in every machine. Uh, we're going to use machine one, but we'll, you'll be able to see how you can extrapolate that to multiple machines. So we're going to get this data collection, and now we've got a sort of imagine a line between public and private IP addressing. We need our network administrator to define a rule. So with every translation, we need to have a rule, and here we're going to have a host rule that says HMI on the, on the inside device, which is the HMI machine. Again, it's on the public, oh, sorry, it's on the private inside, and we're going to give it a known, unique, routable IP address on the public side, which is 10.0.0.99. And because we didn't have one before, now we need to make sure that there's a link between the IE switch to the zone switch, and that's the where the, the translated packets are going to traverse. Now let's take this and focus our example a little bit more as we prepare uh, 
for uh, how it's actually going to work. We've got over on the right side, we've got the HMI machine, we know its IP address, but now we've given it a gateway of 192.168.1.1. And then moving just to the left, we have our layer two NAT switch. And we've said, okay, our uplink is gig one slash one. And um, below that we see we have this thing called a layer two NAT instance. So this is the CLI configuration for it. And this is how you would create an instance uh, for doing layer two NAT translation. You'll notice that I have at the first line an outside from host, and that's this device here. So the layer three gateway is the gateway for the 1000X subnet. And I need to translate that for the HMI machine. So I have an outside rule, right? And it's gonna go from a public to private. And I've identified this with gateway. The gateway command, uh, a keyword here is optional, but it does help with reading the translation configuration. And then we saw this rule before. We have an inside from host on what the internal IP address is to the external unique IP address. Then we are going to apply this instance, as we show here, to our uplink interface, and we say we want it to operate on VLAN 3004. This is important. We are not going to route this packet or the communication between the HMI and the gateway. This is a layer two connection. It does not change VLANs. The forwarding decision being made by the IE switch is based on destination MAC addresses, not destination IP addresses. Layer two NAT is not routing. All right, so now let's do some animation to show you how it's going to work. We've got our data collection app on the left and we've got some simplified configuration there on the right. Everything's all set up. So let's see how it works uh, through the miracle of animation. Now, this is probably not how a data collection application would start trying to communicate with a uh, HMI and machine one, but I wanted to show ICMP gets fixed up. So I just decided we're just gonna use that. Um, so the echo request comes uh, from the client device, or sorry, the data collection. It pings the client, uh, which is HMI. And only the data collection app knows the HMI machine one as 10.0.99. It doesn't know it as any other IP address. This is the IP address that the public knows these, this uh, HMI is. So this gets routed to the gateway. Uh, because we hit a layer three hop, all the MAC addresses change. This gets forwarded then to the IE switch, which makes a switching decision based upon MAC addresses. It ends up at machine one. Now, machine one, let's just say, for instance, doesn't know how to communicate with its gateway, so it does an ARP request for its gateway. So it will ARP for what it's been, its gateway it's configured for, 192.168.1.1, and it provides its own IP address. There's a rule for both of these IP addresses in our instance, as we summarized up here. So both of those get fixed up, not only in the layer three header, but ARP and ping also get fixed up in the payload because they have IP addresses in the payload. And that gets back to the layer three gateway. Then the layer three gateway will respond so it sends its ARP reply back. That also gets fixed up through layer two NAT because we have a rule for 10001. That arrives back at the HMI. And now the HMI can respond back to the original uh, echo request with a reply. It uses its own source IP address because it doesn't know what else to use. That's its IP address. And we did not have a rule for the destination IP address. So that remains the same. So that does not get translated on the response. But we do translate 192.168.1.3 from inside to the unique outside. And then this gets layer three forwarded to the data collection app. Now I used ping and ARP in this example, but it would work the same for UDP or TCP, right? We're going to take the layer three header and translate those IP addresses if there's a rule for that VLAN on that interface. 
And if this didn't make sense, rewind the video a little bit and play it again. Now, in application across machines, now the only reason you would do this in the first place typically is because you've got multiple machines and each machine has got components with the same IP addresses, so you need to translate in order to communicate with those machines. But there's another problem now. You can't just hook all the machines up to the same VLAN and expect there to be no problems. You've got to be aware of these layer two broadcasts. So when these, when HMI, so when the HMI here is trying to communicate with the controller at 1.2 and it does an ARP for who has 192.168.1.2, this controller is going to respond as well because that ARP is broadcast throughout VLAN 3004. So you have a race condition and you have duplicate IP addresses and essentially your machines will stop working. So you need to plan for this. So one solution is more VLANs so that there's no broadcast domain created at whatever is operating as your zone switch. And you need, typically then you would need unique subnets per VLAN. I'm using slash 24s here, but you could use smaller subnets, slash 28s or slash 29s, to preserve on public unique IP addresses. Anyway, so this is sort of the next problem that I come into, that I see when I get pulled into layer two NAT discussions with customers. I hope that's helpful. Now there's more information besides this video. Uh, the configuration guide is pretty good that we have on Cisco in terms of helping you with more layer two NAT translation. And the CPWE, which stands for Connected Plant Wide Ethernet, has a chapter on layer two network address translation. And finally, layer two NAT does not work through layer three. It switches the packets. It's not routing. Thanks for watching all the way to the end.